Hello and welcome to lecture three of financial statement analysis. Today's topic is going to be on accounting analysis. Looking at our business analysis framework here, we can see that accounting analysis is the first part of step two, which is analyzing our accounting information. So last week we spent some time on step one, which is on understanding the business. And we learned the importance of an economic analysis, industry analysis, and business strategy analysis. This is all qualitative information where we get to understand the business generally and qualitatively. Now we're going to actually start looking at financial statements. So our subject name, financial statement analysis, now we're going to start living up to that subject name. So that's the role of the accounting analysis. So in this subject, our overall big picture goal is to learn how to value a business. And to learn how to value a business, we're going to read the financial statements and get lots of information from the statements to uh, put into our valuation models. So the big question here is, can we actually rely on the accuracy of the financial statements? Well, accounting doesn't often get movies made about it, but when they are, it's always due to the accounting scandals. It's always the times when, no, we can't trust the accounting information. So here are a couple of movies that give you a great setting for the accounting analysis topic, which I feel while we're in lockdown, you might as well watch a few movies. This one's a documentary on Netflix, Dirty Money, and I really recommend episode one. It's on Valiant Pharmaceuticals, which was the largest pharmaceutical company in Canada. And over the last couple of years, its share price went really, really high, hundreds of dollars per share. And then it crashed down to less than $10 per share. An Australian hedge fund manager was heavily involved in this. During the time the share price was increasing, he was writing publicly about issues he found with the firm's accounting and how the accounting didn't make sense to him. And he put it all on his blog posts. And in this particular documentary, him, himself, John Hempton, and a few other uh, short sellers and people who are looking at the accounting closely really got an understanding of this business. And because it was a pharmaceutical company, it also touches on the idea of monopoly pricing power and how they were able to charge ridiculous prices for the goods they were selling. So this is a great one, episode one, which is on uh, Valiant Pharmaceuticals. Really check it out. It touches on industry analysis and the power of a monopoly, as well as accounting analysis and the lengths and depths of research that people put in to figure out if the accounting made sense. I haven't seen this movie myself, so if you have seen it, let me know if it's worth checking out. It's called The Wizard of Lies and it's on Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff had the largest ever Ponzi scheme. So he ripped off about $17 billion from investors all through fake reporting, pretending that he was generating high returns every year while taking more money from new investors and paying out the old investors. So that's the Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme and there's a big movie on that. Uh, as we go through the accounting analysis, I'm gonna finish off this lecture talking about audit reports. And just as a heads up, the auditor of this multi-billion dollar firm was just one guy in a home office. It was a red flag from the very beginning. And the famous one, a lot of you would have heard plenty about Enron in your prior accounting subjects. Always good to watch that movie and check it out if you haven't seen it. So I asked the question, can we trust accounting information? If we follow the movies, the answer is definitely no, we can't trust accounting information. Every accounting movie, it's always due to lying, cheating and stealing. However, the framework of accounting does actually allow us to have a little bit more uh, trust in the accounting system. So our lecture goal today is to conduct an accounting analysis, which means that we need to assess the degree to which the firm's accounting reflects the underlying business reality. We're going to then identify if we think there's any accounting distortions and evaluate if those distortions impact on the profit and loss of the firm. This figure from lecture one and from our textbook shows us the framework for accounting. So up here we have the business environment, business activity, and business strategy. These are the real operations that the business are doing. This is what's actually happening in the real world. Then what's actually happening with the business, that is the underlying economics of the business, interacts with the manager's accounting strategy, the firm's actual accounting system and what information they capture, and the broad accounting environment for a particular country or economy. All of these factors play and interact together to come up with financial statements. These are the financial statements that we actually have to analyze. So based on all these interrelated factors, accounting quality will differ. It will differ between different firms. It will differ between different country, depending on what accounting standards you use, what regulators govern your particular business, all of these factors will lead to varying levels of trustworthiness in our financial statements. So with our knowledge of the accounting framework, 
we can sort of boil it down to three areas where there may be reasons for accounting information to be distorted. And we're going to look at each of these three reasons in a bit of detail. The first one is where GAP, GAP stands for Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. So in Australia, we'd be referring to IFRS, the International Financial Reporting Standards. Sometimes those international financial reporting standards don't allow businesses to actually report their economic reality. That is, the accounting standards prevent you from reporting what's actually happening. The second reason for accounting distortions is innocent forecast errors. We have to think about the future a lot in accounting, and sometimes we make mistakes with our forecasts. And the third category is managerial manipulation. These are the categories where those movies get made, when managers are deliberately biasing the financial statements. Now, it could be a little bit legally, which is called earnings management, or it could go all the way out to full-blown fraud, like, for example, Enron. The first category of accounting distortion, which is when the accounting standards don't necessarily reflect economic reality, can be explained with some simple examples. So if we look at the asset side of the balance sheet, if I buy goods for $50 that I eventually hope to sell, I would record this as inventory on my balance sheet. So if I spend $50 buying inventory, I'm going to record an asset on my balance sheet worth $50. However, a similar transaction, which the accounting standards say we cannot record, would be if I spend $300 investing in research and development to develop a new drug. The accounting standards say that you cannot record research costs as an asset. So even if the drug is working well in trials, the $300 I spent, I can't refer to that as an asset. It has to be an expense. So these two businesses are both investing money on something they hope will make uh, future returns. One is buying inventory. The other is developing a new product to sell. And the way that we account for them is different. So the accounting standards prevent the business from accurately reflecting its economic reality in some situations. Let's look at the other side of the balance sheet, the liability section. Similar to the previous example, liabilities sometimes don't get recorded in a way that reflects the economic reality. So our first situation makes a lot of sense. If I buy goods from a supplier for $50, but I don't have to pay until next year, I'm going to record a liability called accounts payable. And that liability is going to be for the $50 that I owe my supplier. However, if another company is suing me for breach of contract, and I'm going to go to court and I expect to fight the charges, but there is a chance that I'm going to lose that uh, court case, I may end up owing a significant amount of money. So there's a chance or a possibility that I'll have a significant liability to pay. That is the economic reality. However, the accounting says there is no liability because we can only record liabilities when they are guaranteed. Now, there are rules in place where we're allowed to put in some footnotes for contingent liabilities, and depending on how likely it is that I'm going to lose the court case, they may be disclosed in the notes to the financial statement. But the expected loss from the court case won't show up on my liability section on the balance sheet. So again, the balance sheet may not fully reflect the economic reality of the business. I just provided two simple examples of assets and liabilities where the accounting standards may prevent the balance sheet from fully disclosing the picture of the business. And of course, there are many other situations in the accounting standards where this might pop up. So a big issue that you may face is that brand values are not recognized as an asset. So if you look at Coca-Cola and McDonald's, these businesses are hugely valuable businesses based purely on their branding. Now, the accounting rules say you can't record the branding. So if Coca-Cola spend millions and millions of dollars on an advertising campaign, they must record that as an expense in the current period, even though we know that over time, all of these expenses are actually generating this very valuable brand that does not get recorded on the balance sheet. However, sometimes we can record brands. That is, if we buy another business, we can record goodwill if we have paid money for a, another business that has a good brand. So sometimes branding is on the balance sheet via the goodwill. Other times it's not if it's internally generated. So the accounting standards don't always reflect economic reality when it comes to brands. We all know that the price of property and land often increases over time. Sometimes it decreases, but for most of Australian history, land prices have been going up over time. Now, accounting has this trade-off between reliability versus relevance. Reliability says you record the value of your assets at their historic cost. So if a business bought some land in 1970 for $10,000 in Sydney, that land may now be worth millions of dollars the balance sheet would still show the land as being worth $10,000. So that is the accounting rule saying historic cost 
the economic reality is that land is worth millions of dollars. So they don't always match up. Now, the accounting standards do allow for businesses to revalue their land or revalue asset classes, but then in, not all businesses will do the revaluations. So there's going to be a difference between the old value of the land and the current value. Some businesses may revalue to try and make sure they match up, whereas other similar businesses in the same industry may not do the revaluations. So there's going to be cases when the accounting standards do or don't match the, uh, the reality of the current land prices. Another example is inventory. All businesses that either buy or make their own inventory plan to sell it for a profit. So if I manufacture my own inventory and it costs $10 per widget, I hope to sell those widgets for more than $10. That is, the value of those widgets should be more than $10. But the accounting rules say you must value your inventory at the lower of cost or net realizable value. You can only record the increase in value of that inventory when you sell it. So I might have millions of dollars of inventory, but until I sell it, I can't record that, that value. On the other hand, some businesses may have obsolete inventory that they're still recording at cost value that if they sold, they wouldn't get that much money. So they should lower the value using the net realizable value method. But as we talk about later, there might be reasons why managers are reluctant to do that. And the value of their inventory on their balance sheet might not match the real value that people would pay for it. The second category that is likely to lead to accounting distortions are forecast errors. Now, accounting, financial accounting in particular, is mostly historical looking. We're looking at prior transactions and what's happened previously in the business. However, with accrual accounting, we also do have to make a lot of forecasts and estimations about what's likely to happen in the future. And whenever we're trying to predict the future, we're going to make some mistakes. They might be innocent mistakes where we thought we were doing the right thing and we tried our best, or they might be deliberate mistakes where we're trying to slightly manipulate or bias the accounting outcomes. So when do we have to do forecasting and estimation in accounting? Well, there's many situations, but I'm going to give you a few of the simple ones that you've learned in your introductory accounting subjects. Depreciation. For all non-current assets that the business has, we have to depreciate those assets. And depreciation requires lots of estimations. Two of the forward-looking estimations we have to make are how long is the asset going to last? That is, what is its useful life? Will this building last for 20 years or 40 years? And then the residual value of an asset. Will the building be worth a million dollars or $10 million in 20 or 40 years? These are estimates that the accountant has to make. We're always going to make mistakes with our forecasts. If we're trying our best, we assume sometimes we'll be a little bit too optimistic, sometimes we'll be a little bit pessimistic, and hopefully it balances out to lead to some accurate numbers. But sometimes we might be biased in our forecasting, and we might always be optimistic or always pessimistic, and that could lead to some big errors accruing over the years. Another situation in which we have to forecast future numbers would be accounts receivable. I sell things to my customers, I hope they pay me back. But I know that not all customers will pay me back. They might get sick, they might go bankrupt, they might go out of business. All these kind of things could pop up, which means they're not going to pay me the money they owe me. So I have to estimate a bad debt expense and create an allowance for bad debts. These are, again, estimates that the accountant has to come up with. Last year, maybe 3% of my customers didn't pay. So I'll assume that next year, 3% of my customers won't pay me. But then something like the COVID crisis might pop up and lots of people are out of work and the expectation that only 3% of my customers won't pay me could be completely wrong. It could turn out to be 7 or 8 or 9%, much higher than we estimated. That means that our bad debt expense would have been too low in early periods and we'll have to increase it in late, later times when we find out these customers aren't paying us back. Inventory, we hope, is always going to be sold for a value above what it cost us. And sometimes that's wrong. Sometimes our inventory goes out of date, it becomes obsolete, it gets damaged, and we have to sell it for less than it cost. So when we record inventory on the balance sheet at lower of cost or net realizable value, most businesses will be recording it at cost value, hoping to then sell it for more than the cost. But if things happen and they have to have heavy discounts, they may end up selling the inventory for less than that amount. So their forecast of selling the inventory for higher prices was wrong. They end up selling it for less. They'll have to take a hit on the sale. Property, plant and equipment. 
the value in use when we're recording the value of our property plant and equipment, we have to do some valuation on the different assets that we have to make sure that they're actually worth what we think they are. And these are going to require us often discounted cash flow models. And as we talk about our valuation models in future weeks, you'll learn we're going to make some mistakes with these forecasts and the inputs into that as well. So a lot of assets require valuation techniques and we could make forecasting errors with those as well. So we've looked at two situations in which accounting may be distorted. The first one was when the accounting standards don't match perfectly against the economic reality. And the second one was when we might have innocent forecast errors. This slide here illustrates some of the particular industries and some of the cases where their forecasting may be inaccurate. The harder or more important uh, accounts for these particular businesses where they're most likely to make errors. So for example, a manufacturing firm needs to estimate their warranty expense and their provision for warranties. A established manufacturer who's making the same product year after year with the same machinery is gonna have a pretty good understanding of their defect rate. However, a new manufacturing firm or a firm that's releasing new products rapidly may have rapidly changing defect rates and they may get their warranty expense and warranty provisions incorrect. Tobacco companies, their liabilities for health effects they would have had to have large provisions for potential losses in court for all the health causes. Now, predicting the outcome of these court cases is going to be very hard. So these particular liabilities that they may have and the reserves that they've got, they could easily be very inaccurate based on the uncertainty regarding those particular forecasts. The real estate industry is massive in Australia. We've got lots of real estate firms listed on the Australian stock market and estimating property values and the expectation of property value growth and rental returns can fluctuate a lot as well. So the carrying values of your properties when you're doing revaluation could also be an issue where it could easily be incorrect, even if the accountants are trying to do their best and trying to get it accurate. So have a look down this list and check out the different industries and you'll be able to figure out why particular industries have different accounts that are more important for their business and why they may be harder to forecast correctly. The third and final reason why accounting may be distorted is because of managerial manipulation. Now it's important to realize that businesses create their financial statements and it's the managers of those businesses, the CEOs and the CFOs who actually put together that accounting strategy and have to create the financial reports. Now this has both pros and cons. The pro is the managers understand their business the best. So when the accounting standards allow for discretion, the managers can use that discretion to most accurately let people know what's happening with their business. They know they're going to be the best person to estimate future delinquency rates and credit losses because they understand the business and the industry better than anyone else. However, the disadvantage of this is that managers may sometimes face incentives to bias the accounting results or to outright manipulate the accounting results and commit fraud. So we put managers in a place to create the financial statements. We hope that they use their superior knowledge of the firm to report accurately and use their knowledge to make really high quality estimations of the future. But the risk is sometimes they might use the discretion in accounting standards to slightly bias either way the reported results. So what we're going to talk about now is the different incentives managers may face to bias the results. So managers are going to face pressure to report certain numbers. They have a whole range of different reporting requirements. They're reporting their financial statements to banks, to governments, to investors, and all of these different stakeholders might have different wants and needs from the financial statements. And depending on what pressure the managers face, they may be likely to bias the financial reporting in certain ways. So we're gonna look at some of these particular factors and go through why managers might face pressure from this factor and how it might influence or distort the accounting. So we've got a figure here from a paper published in the Journal of Accounting and Economics by Graham Harvey and Raj Kapoor. They surveyed a lot of managers of CFOs and CEOs and they asked the question, meeting earnings benchmarks helps and most managers think meeting earnings benchmark is very helpful. It builds credibility with the capital market. It maintains or increases stock prices. It helps improve their reputation as a manager. So managers, when they're reporting their earnings to the stock market, the analysts who follow the companies will have expectations. We think that this company is going to make $2.2 billion this year. 
So when the managers are putting their financial statements together, if it looks like they're not going to reach $2.2 billion, then they have to start thinking about what can we do to reach that benchmark? We know it's really important to reach the benchmark. If we don't, we might be in a little bit of trouble. So the next question here, near the end of the quarter, it looks like your company might come in below the desired earnings target. We're going to be below the $2.2 billion earnings target. What will you do? So managers could discrete decrease discretionary spending, such as lowering advertising and research and development. Okay, that's an actual change to your business, not an accounting change. You might delay starting a new product or project. Again, another real change to the business. Then we get to accounting distortions. We might try and book revenue now rather than next quarter, if justified in either quarter. We could draw down on reserves previously set aside. We could postpone taking an accounting charge or alter accounting assumptions. Now, if we look at the percentages, only about 40% of managers said they're doing the change in when they record their revenues. So accounting manipulation is not so common if we're earning benchmark, but 40% of managers doing it is still a significant chunk. So it's something we have to be aware of. Do we have any evidence that it actually happens? Well, this paper, again, in the Journal of Accounting and Economics, looks at what's called benchmark beating. And they've done it a range of ways, but the main story of this paper is presented in this graph. We know what a normal distribution looks like. So this is pretty close to a normal distribution, except where this line is here, that is a change in earnings for a particular firm or all the companies listed in America. And they've looked at this kind of pattern and graph across if firms have earned more than zero profit, so not reporting a loss reporting slightly higher than their benchmark. So not just missing the benchmark, but just beating the benchmark and reporting slightly higher profits than last year. So all these are kind of benchmarks that firms have. And we find that the normal distribution fails just short of the zero point here. So it's very rare that companies will report a very small loss. We expect that if a company is going to report a very small loss, or report earnings a little bit less than last year, or report earnings that are slightly less than what the analysts think they'll earn, they will use some accounting tricks to go from where they should be about here and boost their earnings up here. So that's why we have a spike just above the zero and a less than expected amount just here. Managers have pressure to beat benchmarks. There's a range of benchmarks they have to beat. And if they look like they're gonna fall short of that, they might bias the accounting statements to get there. We also have evidence that managers are likely to bias the financial reporting when there's a CEO change. This paper from 2002 in Accounting and Finance by Peter Wells, who's one of the professors here at UTS, finds that when there are CEO changes, the new CEO is often likely to do what's called take an earnings bath. That means the CEO in their first year is going to record any expenses they can. They might impair their assets, they might really increase their advertising and research and all these kind of things to have a bad first year. They then blame their first bad year on last year's CEO, the CEO who left. So then in year two, they've got less assets to depreciate and they've had an increased spending in advertising, research and maintenance in the prior year so they can cut those costs this year and they'll report a higher than expected profit in their second year. So new CEOs often make drastic changes in their first year, blame those negative consequences on the pre previous management team. Then in year two onwards, they can report higher profits than otherwise. That's called big bath accounting. And there's evidence that new CEOs engage in that routinely. Another area where managers often manipulate the accounting figures is called income smoothing. So over here, we've got earnings per share changes each year for General Electric, when they were under their CEO, Jack Welch. Every year, their EPS, their earnings per share, grew by a reasonably stable amount, somewhere between 15 and 20%. It was very consistent. This CEO liked having predictable, smooth earnings that grew by a predictable and smooth amount every year. Many companies like to show that they are predictable and mature and consistent in their performance. So they wanna report smooth earnings. A new CEO came in with new reporting policies, and we can see suddenly the earnings became very volatile. So these two CEOs had different styles. So 
there's evidence that something has changed. One of these managers must have been engaging in financial accounting tricks or business operations tricks to change their reported financial performance quite greatly between those two. Then in the last couple of years, GE's had a lot of problems and problems with their accounting has really come to the fore. We've seen that there's lots of issues and analysts, the media, the regulators have all discussed General Electric's bad accounting techniques. CEO compensation is another obvious one where they may have incentives to manipulate the accounting results. This paper here looks at the bonuses of CEOs. And what it finds is that when CEOs have reached their target performance, such as if I'm running a business and they say, you'll earn a bonus for every extra million dollars this company makes up to a maximum of a billion dollars. Well, once my company's performance has reached the billion dollar profit target, I've got no incentive to increase my performance anymore. So this paper finds that when managers actually reach their maximum bonus, they then use accounting techniques to minimize any extra profit. They try and save any excess profit for next year to make next year's bonus easier to get. If my bonus is maxed out, I have no more incentive to increase my profit this year. I start doing things with the business to postpone those profits until next year to make next year's bonus easier to get. Managers will often have pressure when they're looking for external funding. So when they're raising capital, whether it's debt finance, going to the bank and borrowing money, going to the bond market and borrowing money, or selling shares to equity investors. When they're looking for more money, they have incentives to make the financial statements look really good, look like a successful, profitable, growing business. This paper here looks at the IPO market, which is initial public offerings, which means when a company is being sold to the public for the first time. So the first time that the public can actually buy shares in a company is called an initial public offering. So this study finds that in the year of the IPO, the firm's net income over sales, this is called the profit margin, is on average 4.6%. Then every year after the IPO, the profit margin decreases quite rapidly. This might be a sign that firms are using tricks to boost their income in early years when they're trying to sell shares and maximize the share price. If we look at the accruals over book value, accruals are the differences between the firm's earnings and cash flows. They're very high, they're very aggressive, and then it reverses out. So the business might be using accrual accounting in this year to make their profit margins look better, to make their profits higher, and then over time, accruals reverse, and the profit margins decrease. And looking at a specific account where this could be illustrated is the allowance for uncollectibles over gross accounts receivable. So looking at your bad debt percentage. In year, the year of the IPO, the bad debt ex on average across all IPO firms was 2.9%. And then we can see every year after that, it kept increasing. So firms might have been a little bit aggressive, minimizing their bad debt expense in the year of the IPO to maximize profit. And then as time goes on, they start to become more realistic in their estimations. So this is for an IPO sample of all American IPOs before 1998. And we can see similar evidence when firms are looking to borrow money or sell shares with seasoned equity offerings as well. So I've just discussed three broad reasons why accounting might be distorted, why it might not be perfectly accurate. The three reasons were that sometimes the accounting standards don't match the economic reality of the firm. The second reason was sometimes we have forecasting errors. Accounting requires forecasting into the future of depreciation, future discount rates, valuations of liabilities. All of these things may end up being forecast incorrectly due to the difficulty in doing forecasting. And the third category was managers sometimes have incentives to manipulate their earnings. And I went through a range of different situations in which managers may face incentives to bias the accounting results. Next up, we're going to actually look at how to conduct an accounting analysis. How do we find if managers are doing these manipulations? How do we find if it's likely a firm's got forecast errors? And how do we know if your business faces situations where the accounting doesn't match reality?